Well, thank you very much for your introduction. And uh, it's true uh, what you said that I'm, um, uh, I have a PhD in economics, but that shows you, and that's not very interesting or important, but it shows you that people, even in economics, can be interested in spiritual uh, subjects. So uh, having said that, you also mentioned uh, my upcoming book uh, on uh, the, the, with uh, quotes from more than 100 near-death experiencers. Um, I, I think uh, there's, uh, I, I have a, a publisher, but I, it, it, I, it's very early stage, so I have to uh, wait for that. My presentation is going to be based on what I wrote in that book. Um, because there are quotes from people you might know, famous ones like Ibn Alexander and Anita Morjani or Daniel Brinkley, uh, George Ritchie, but also a lot of people who are not so very uh, in, um, uh, well known. And I got permissions from all of them. So, uh, and the reason that I wanted to write this, uh, this book was to make sure that um, people can have an impression of what near-death experiences are, because there is no standard uh, NDE. There, uh, there are no identical NDE. So every time you hear an NDE, it's different. There are new elements in it. And when, you, uh, when, you, when I give quotes uh, based on, uh, in this case, 12 important aspects of NDEs, then people can decide for themselves uh, what is important for them or what they take from it. Uh, I don't have to tell them. Um, uh, but if you, would you ask me uh, what I think of NDEs uh, and what I take uh, from them uh, after having had uh, the opportunity to see so many uh, quotes and people uh, with NDEs, then foremost, it's uh, love, unconditional kind of love. And the second one would be unity. We are one. And it seems like we are one uh, and love binds us. So that is what I take from it. But let me uh, go over the, the 12 uh, aspects of uh, NDEs that I get out of it, uh, out of all these quotes. And it sounds like a lot. It's 12. So you have to buckle up. Uh, uh, it's, I have to cover a lot of ground together with you. Uh, so bear with me. The first uh, thing uh, is uh, the starting point. Uh, um, and uh, there are a number of uh, uh, disclaimers I have to make. Uh, first of all, uh, NDEs are overwhelming experiences. Uh, they are a life changer for those who have had it. Uh, and the term is sort of wrong, I think, because it, it gives the impression that you only get an, an NDE when you're near death, and, but that's not always the case. And I know there is new terminology there with uh, spiritual transformative uh, experiences, but all of those experiences come down to the same thing. And that, so I think the term is kind of difficult. Another thing is that there are no standard NDEs. I said that before. Uh, another thing is that they are ineffable and then uh, there's too much for people, uh, for NDEers to take back home to, to earth. So all of that makes it difficult to really do research uh, on NDEs in, in the sense that, well, no standard NDEs, people cannot really express what they uh, experienced and there's, uh, they have lost a lot of information on their way back to their body. Now, having said that, that's the, the first uh, bit. Then my second uh, aspect is out-of-body experience. Um, exiting one's body seems to be very, very easy. One person said it's like uh, toast, popping out of a toaster. It's that easy. Uh, the next one moment you're in your body, next moment you're out. And to give a few examples, I uh, wanted to, uh, to, to tell you the story about uh, Ellen Dye. She is, uh, she, you might know her, she's also in Irons. Um, she went in her car at night uh, 
um, on a road and there was a, an oncoming car. And the oncoming car took a turn without indicating and they uh, went into a collision. Then suddenly she was outside her body. So it goes very quickly. She was hovering above the car, looking onto the car, looking how the guy got out of his car, went over to her car, and she thought to see if she was okay. But then he turned off her lights. So to, to give an indication that she was driving in uh, with, without lights. But the thing was that she was hovering above the car, looking down at the car, and then seeing also her body through the roof of the car and thinking, how is that possible? I am here thinking while my body is somewhere else. That is something that many NDE ears uh, experience. They are, they are confused by what happens to them. Another example is uh, from a woman who was taken into hospital. She was uh, lying in bed um, when uh, things went worse. Then uh, she got out of her body. She looked down at her bed and she saw a woman lying there who had the same kind of uh, night nightgown. And she thought, that's interesting. There's this other woman who has the same nightgown and she didn't realize that it was her. Of course, a bit later she got to realize that it was her. And then she went on in her near-death experience in, in looking around in the, in the uh, hospital. And she found her husband in the corridor talking on a phone to her friend in another state. Now what happened then was that she was there with her husband talking into the phone. When the friend in the other state was replying, she was with that other friend in that other state at her place listening in. When her husband would answer again, she would be back in the hospital again and it went back and forth. So it gives you an impression that place is not an issue, but that it, can, it, it is a very strange situation that you can go into. Another ex example is um, Elizabeth Crone. I, I like that example very much because she was uh, driving in her car to the synagogue. Um, once she was on the, uh, on the parking lot, uh, there was a, a big thunderstorm. Uh, so, and she had her two children with her. She got out of the car, grabbed her umbrella, walked onto the synagogue, and then suddenly there was a big thunder and a, a lightning at the same time. And she thought, okay, and she felt sizzling somewhere, but she thought, I'm okay, let me just continue walking. And she went onto the, uh, onto the synagogue, but she saw one of her children screaming, running into the synagogue. Once she was there, she noticed that there was a big uh, confusion and people were looking out the window what had happened outside. She turned around and she saw her umbrella on the ground, uh, blackened and, and uh, burned. And she saw her body a little bit further on the pavement. And she also saw that her shoes were damaged. And she was very sad about, about that because those were new. She, she said that in her book very nicely. She was uh, very upset about that. But then the next moment she realized that if I'm here, my, my body is lying there, what happened? And, to, and the last example that I would like to give here is uh, one from Nancy Rhines, uh, where she had a dual perspective of what happened. Now, Nancy was in a car accident. She was uh, riding her bicycle and um, she was uh, run over by a big SUV. Um, she exited her body very quickly, but she had a dual perspective. She had one perspective of her lying on the ground under the grill of the SUV, looking up to the grill, 
And the other perspective was hovering far above the whole scene, looking down at, the, at what had happened. And she could see it both at the same time. Just, I, I just wanted to stress that, that so exiting your body is very easy. It's like toast uh, popping out of a toaster, but you still have uh, a very strange thing going on with that you can see yourself in diff from different perspectives. Going over to number three, uh, so the third point, um, it's vertical observations. Now, if I, if I talk to, I, if I do my presentations, um, people ask me, are these near-death experiences real? Now, that, I think that's a good question. And I think uh, scientific proof is very difficult to give. Um, the, the only thing that I think with, um, uh, with scientific proof is that we look at vertical observations. And I'll, I'll try to explain what they, these are. These are uh, situations where an NDE -er gets out of his or her body has the possibility of looking around uh, where she was, like for instance, in a hospital or near a car accident, and then sees something that she can later, that he or she can later tell when, uh, when coming back, and then that it is uh, checked and confirmed. And I'll, I'll give you a few examples, but there are, hundreds of these examples and to me these examples give you um, circumstantial evidence uh, that these experiences are real. Now they are real in the sense that it shows you that your consciousness can exist independent from uh, your body so that's that's uh, one thing. It does not give an explanation or proof of uh, the afterlife. But I think if we can go that far that uh, we determine that there is circumstantial evidence that our consciousness can exist outside our body, why not look at what the messages are from all those and the ears and see if they hold interesting information. Now, to give you a few examples of these vertical observations, because they are really important in, from a, a scientific perspective. The first one is uh, Operation Standstill. Uh, there is, uh, there is, it's a good documented uh, uh, example. Uh, and this is from a woman who had to undergo uh, an uh, operation because in her brain, there was um, a vein that had been uh, uh, swollen and had to be taken away. It's uh, called an aneurysm. Um, they had to cool down her body uh, to about uh, 60 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, they had to uh, stop her heartbeat uh, and her breathing. Uh, it sounds terrible <laughs> what they did, but they did it anyway in order, and they drained the blood from her brain. And that it was done in order to, uh, to uh, uh, deflate, so to speak, the, the vein so that it could mend it and then uh, reflate it again with, uh, with blood. And then she could start living again with, with uh, uh, repaired veins. Now, she was in the hospital lying on this operation table uh, under very clearly observed uh, situation. Um, she saw everything that had happened there. She could tell what the doctors did. They, she could tell uh, the discussion that went on between the nurse and the doctor about her veins being too, too narrow, too small. Uh, she, she saw a lot of things. Uh, she couldn't have heard it because she was out. And in addition, she had uh, earplugs in that emitted a, 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 a blasts of about 100 decibel. Now I can tell you that's really, really very loud. So, it, And that was done to be able to monitor if there would be any uh, brain activity. 
Um, so she could really tell later what had happened during the operation. Now that means that she, she must have been somewhere in order to do that. Another example is that of uh, the, the flapping surgeon. Now there was this, this guy who, had, who needed um, um, bypasses because his heart was uh, bad. So he was on the operation table. Uh, the doctor came in and told him what they were going to do. Now, um, then they also uh, administered, um, um, uh, how do you call that? Uh, um, uh, yeah, general anesthetic. So he faded away. The next moment he was, it was dark, it was dark. He didn't see anything. And then the next moment after it, he could see everything again because he was outside his body. And then he could see everything that went on in the operation uh, room. He saw, for instance, through the table and through his own body, he could see what kind of shoes, uh, like boot-like uh, things the doctor was wearing. And the most interesting part was that he at one moment saw the doctor backing up from his uh, from the operation table and then started uh, yeah flapping his arms his elbows he put his uh, hands to his chest and started using his elbows to do like as if he was a, a duck or so like he was flying and then later of course the operation went uh, right it went good uh, he could uh, he came uh, through again and uh, he was able to talk about this experience. And then he's, he asked the doctor, what were you doing? What was this? And at first the doctor didn't want to tell anything because he thought he was uh, questioned about his uh, ability to do an operation. And of course, in the United States, there's a lot of litigation going on. So he was afraid of, of that. And he, he thought, I'm not going to say anything. A bit later, uh, the researcher, and by the way, that was a, a Dutch researcher, uh, asked him uh, uh, to have an interview. And then it appeared that he was using his elbows uh, to point at the instruments that he needed. You have to understand that his, his hands were sterile and he didn't want to use his hands to, to do anything with it. So he used his elbows to point out, to, to indicate the, the nurses what he needed. Now that you couldn't have known that if you weren't outside your body, if, he, if the, the patient wouldn't have registered this from some, some perspective. And then the, the last example that I would like to, to bring forward is the, <clears throat> the smoking uh, gran grannies. Uh, I like that story very much. There's this young woman who was on a, in a car accident uh, on a highway in the United States. She was taken by helicopter to the, ho uh, to the hospital. So she couldn't have seen anything in the hospital and she was out all the time. Um, and of course the parents, uh, and also in this case, the two grandmas uh, were in the hospital waiting for news. Uh, and she said later, later she said, I could see you sitting there. I could see what was going on. She was out for uh, more than a week, a few weeks, I think. But during that period, she had a few times, she had this, uh, this ability to get out of her body and wander around in, in the hospital. And then she and the, the, the parents didn't believe her. Uh, and this is nonsense. This cannot be the case. And then she said one time she said, "Then well, I saw you sitting in the cafeteria, and you were uh, anxious to hear about what was going on with me. Uh, and uh, my father, was, uh, a papa, went outside to smoke because he couldn't uh, bear it any longer. And the funny thing was that the first grandma." went outside as well because she wanted to smoke and you have to know that she didn't smoke and she would never smoke and the second grandma did the same thing went outside the room outside the hospital to go for a smoke and also this one didn't smoke now that was the moment that the parents started believing her now this shows you these kind of stories show you that uh, someone can be outside the body and see things
So your consciousness, that's something that we can take from all these experiences. Uh, that's circumstantial evidence that your, your consciousness can exist outside your body. It doesn't need your body to be conscious. Now that's, that concludes number three. Uh, so now we have it out of the way that uh, the, these experiences are real. Now let's see what the experiences are about. Um, always it's said that they are more real and more lively and more dimensional uh, than, than life, than the life that we lead here. People say they are more free and uh, there's a lot of freedom going on there. Um, uh, and then a, a friend of mine in, in Amsterdam here, she is a, a psychic medium. Uh, she had a near-death experience and she said, I cannot explain uh, how that is, what you experience there, because she says, it's like, it's like playing Beethoven on a bucket, or it's like painting a Rembrandt uh, with, uh, on, a, on a, a paving stone with two colors of chalk. You cannot do that. It's, that's difficult. So it's very difficult to explain what is going on there. Um, other people say that there's th this uh, other world is all around. It's also there where you're sitting now in the United States in your own room. And it's here with me in, in Amsterdam. Uh, um, and one person said, it, it seems like this other world is superimposed onto our world. It's there, but you, you cannot see it. And then other things are strange as well, like time. Time is very strange over there. There's a lot of uh, uh, quotes that indicate that, uh, that time is uh, very different. Uh, one person said, I was watching eternity unfold. And other one said, time, time was all there at once. All time was there at the same time. And another one said, my experience was not in the time, it was between the time. Now, I don't quite understand what that would mean, but it gives the impression that time is something strange. It's not like we know here. Here, time is always now. The future will never, uh, it, when it arrives, it's now. And history can never be repeated because it's, it's gone. Now, place is also a, a, a strange thing. Um, Anita Morjani, for instance, in her book, she writes that uh, she had died and that the whole family was there, except for her brother. Now, her brother was sitting in an airplane, rushing over to where she was in order to hopefully be in time uh, for her death to, to maybe say goodbye. But she had died already and she thought of him and the moment she thought of him she was there with him in the plane and she saw the anxiety on his on his face and that he was thinking about uh, will I be in time and all these kind of things she could really see what was happening so she could be there another story that's that's also very interesting is that uh, this, this is an Iranian guy. By the way, I have the quotes come from all over the world. They, they, they come from Europe, uh, New Zealand, the United States, you name it. They, there's quotes from everywhere. This guy is from Iran and he had his uh, near-death experience uh, in a hospital. He was taken into a hospital and then he was outside his body. And then he thought, uh, this is strange. And then uh, um, he was confused. And then he thought of uh, where would his mother be? And the moment he thought of his mother, he would be with her in the kitchen. She didn't know about the accident that he uh, had gone through. And he saw what she was doing there. And then she thought of, uh, and then he thought of other friends. And then the moment he thought of a friend, he would be with that other friend. So he could split himself in parts being there where he was, where his thoughts were. So place is something very strange. 
Another thing that people say is that all knowledge is freely available. That is something that uh, that's interesting to know as well. And then Ellen Dye, you, you remember the, the, the woman with the car accident that I mentioned before. Uh, she said, to some extent, you can create your own world uh, over there. Uh, there seems to be a kind of ability uh, to do that. Now, in her NDE, she would be hovering in a dark place, uh, nothing to see, but it was wonderful nonetheless. It was, she was very happy. She felt uh, an unconditional love. She, was, she thought that was thrilling. It was wonderful, whatever. And then after a while, she thought, okay, this is nice but I'd like to see something more than only the darkness. And then I'll quote you on this one. And then she said, as soon as I had that thought, everything shimmered and shifted. And I found myself looking out over a park-like setting. It was as if a giant hand with many paintbrushes moved across the canvas, painting the scene with the greenest grass, I've ever seen the largest and most beautiful and most alive flowers and trees and rolling hills and etc cetera, etc cetera. it goes on like that um, so to some extent you can you can uh, create you seem to be able to create your own world okay so that was that was four out of this world kind of thing the other thing uh, number five uh, the fifth aspect uh, is love now this in my calculation is number five but to me this is the most important thing that i get from ndes uh, the other being unity yeah? i will come to that later um so i'll give you some quotes there because in every NDE, you will find love to be very important. And then it's not only love, it's unconditional love. And in my presentations, I always ask people to realize what that is, to realize what is unconditional, because it means there are no conditions. It means that you can do, in fact, whatever you want to do, and you'll, you'll get that love anyway. You can dress the way you want to, do, to dress. You can eat whatever you want to eat. You can you can do whatever you want to do. And it's there for everyone, no exceptions. So, and I also say to people, think there's always someone that you think that person is not uh, worthy to receive unconditional love. Well, that's not true. Even for those people, there is uh, unconditional love. And then one person said unconditional love, uh, the term, uh, even that term is inadequate to convey the real thing. So it's even beyond unconditional. I felt loved beyond comprehension. I was loved with the purest love there can be. An ultimate love without judgment. A love what every, everything was made of. And there is only love. There is only love. And then this, this person said, I learned that what people think of as God is the energy of love, which binds the universe together, all life, all physics. The energy of love is the essence of life. Then I go over to the light. Uh, sometimes the light is seen as, as, an, as an entity or uh, uh, and, and we need to cover that as well. So that's number six. And it's pure love, pure peace, pure perfection. Uh, it's all love, unconditional. A Belgian uh, and the ear said it's, it is unity. The light is unity. Uh, someone else said it absorbed me. I became part of it. It sparkled through me. And then uh, there is this, uh, this and the ear who tried to explain that the light is everywhere. And she did it in a, in a wonderful way because she said, we here on earth, uh, we feel the air pressure 
pressing upon us, on our heads, on our, on our hands, like also where you are sitting in the United States, but here in Europe as well. So it's everywhere. The, the, the pressure of air, the column of air on top of your head is pressing down upon you. You won't see it, you won't feel it, uh, you don't notice it, but it's there. In the same way, she said, the light is there as well. It hides in plain sight. So I thought that comparison with the pressure of air uh, was something that is that was noteworthy. Now I come to the number seven would be the life review. And the life review is a very, very powerful uh, part of an NDE. And remember that not every NDE is the same as an other. So there will be people who had never seen during their NDE a life review, but a life review is very powerful in the sense that it, it, it changes people's life very much. The whole NDE does, but a life review is very powerful in that respect. Um, and you can zoom in into a very small detail of your life and you can zoom out again and you see the whole thing. And I'll, I'll give you an example of a, a woman, a very nice elderly lady in the Netherlands. Uh, and she, she, had her, she had her NDE uh, long after she was a child. But during her NDE, during her life review, she saw a few things of her childhood. And now you have to understand that uh, the Netherlands after the war were deprived country. We were really war-torn country. We had nothing. Um, and uh, so sweets, having sweets was like a luxury. And she got a few sweets from her mother to share with uh, some of her friends. And so she went uh, sharing that with her, one of her friends in school, in, in the primary school. Then during her life review, she saw that particular moment and she saw what that did to that person, to her girlfriend uh, in school. And it was as if she could feel that feeling as if she was that girlfriend. She was that girlfriend for a moment and felt how it felt to receive this luxury good in the Netherlands. And she also noticed, and that's uh, an interesting thing, she noticed also that the, the feeling went over to the mother as well, the mother of the, the, the girlfriend. Um, so it ripples, it, rip, it goes further than where you are. And another example of her was that um, one time there was one of the other uh, friends in school, she had a lice. Now, you know, these are these, uh, these little animals in your hair. And at, those, at that time, there, were, there was not any shampoo you could use uh, to, to get rid of those. So you had to do that by hand. Now, this little girl asked her to, to help her. Then in her life review, she saw what, how she had reacted to her uh, girlfriend who had these lies, and it wasn't all very nice. She said, uh, I saw how I re reacted in, in the sense like, like uh, uh, talking out loud, okay, let's go and let's get rid of your lies. And then other people could hear that. Now she felt it as if she was that little girl she felt the stabbing in her heart of her re own remark. But she says to me, that was not the worst part of that particular uh, part of my life review. The pain that I felt was not the worst part. The worst part was that I, I saw that there were other uh, opportunities, that there were other options, that I could have chosen another way uh, to react and that those other ways would be more loving and would add more love to the world. And that's where she said, uh, okay, that, that, that is really, that hurts a lot. Now, also uh, Daniel Brinkley gives an example of his life review. And I, you have to understand he wrote a book about his life. He was not a very nice guy. He said he, said he was uh, a bully. He, was, uh, uh, he fought a lot. Uh, and then he went into this American um, 
institution that went in other countries and had to and he had to kill off uh, um, uh, people. I don't know. So it must have been a, an intelligence agent or whatever. He doesn't say what, what it is, but he went into other countries and killed off people. Now, during his life review, he felt not only how that was for those people that he killed, but he also felt the pain on behalf of uh, the women that were left behind and the children. And he said, that really, that really hurt. And then he also has um, in his book, he mentions that it, it's not only the people that you feel uh, what you did to, but also animals. He gives an example of, uh, he was driving uh, in a car with his uncle. Um, and then at one point in, in the meadows, he, he saw that there was a farmer uh, brutally hitting a goat who tried who had tried to get through the fence and couldn't get out anymore now he he left the car he went over to this guy to this farmer and hit him severely so he would stop beating the goat and he during his life review he felt how the goat was happy for that moment because then he could really get loose again and escape so my message is that it's not only the people that you feel, but also animals. And, and also plants, this, this Iranian guy uh, saw in his, that in his childhood, he was supposed to get uh, fetch water from the river and bring it home. Now, his bucket was so full that it was too heavy. So he thought, okay, I see there a tree that looks kind of thirsty. So let me spill a little of the water near that tree. And then during his life review, he saw how that was, how, that, the, how it went for that tree and how universe was happy that he did that little gesture for that tree. And then uh, the last example that I wanted to tell you uh, on the life review part is that um, this, there is this um, Boy Scout uh, he drowned, um, uh, and then during his life, uh, during his NDE, he gets to see his life. Okay? And then, then he, uh, and there was in the uh, in the presence of an angel-like figure. Then he he tells this angel-like figure, "Okay, uh, I hope I will not be judged too severely about everything that I did." And then this angel-like figure said to him, well, you, you are judged by the most powerful judge there is. And then this Boy Scout uh, frowns and, and, and uh, is, is afraid. And then he says, when will that happen? And then this angel-like figure says, well, that has just happened. The judge is you. So it gives the impression that there's no one judging you. The only one who judges you is you. And you don't have to judge yourself. That's something that comes out of all these NDEs as well. Um, then number eight, point eight. Uh, um, I still have a little time, I think. Uh, everyone is important. Don't think that you're not important. Uh, there is a purpose and plan for everyone. Uh, all beings have a purpose. Uh, and we are here out of our own free will to fulfill our task. And then this, uh, this quote is, I am an individual and a unique fragment of the God force. I am precious, exceedingly precious. It does not matter what I do. I'm asked only to be the love that I and I alone carry on this earth. So there are so many stories from end the years that indicate that everyone is important. And as, a, as a, an other example, Jolene Stout, maybe you know her, um, she was in a, in a marriage that was uh, kind of 
well, not a very happy ma marriage to say the least. She got depressed. Um, this was an Austrian guy. It doesn't mean that all the Austrian guys are bad, but in this case, the marriage was not very happy. Uh, and uh, she was in Austria alone. Uh, she was doing, uh, she, she was working as a, a, an English teacher. And then um, she uh, wanted to die and, and she didn't want to kill herself, but she willed herself to death. That's how she explained it. And then she got her near death experience during one of those sessions that she tried to, to kill herself by her will. It's strange that that can happen, but in any case, she had a wonderful experience. And then suddenly she also had this meeting with, uh, with Jesus. Now, if I say that, then you have to understand that um, Jesus is seen in many NDEs uh, of Western origin. Other deities are seen in, in NDEs of people that have a different uh, background. So, um, but it is important anyway for her. And it's important to understand what Jesus said to her. Jesus said to her, don't waste your life thinking that you're not loved. So don't think, don't waste your life thinking that you're not loved. And she had been thinking about what is the significance of that uh, one line. And she's, she came to the conclusion that apparently I have a life that I can waste. Uh, I, I should do something different with it. And then the other thing is that we are loved. Everyone is loved. And then this example of a gay man, um, he, was, uh, he was weary of his, his um, orientation. He, he didn't like to be gay, but he was gay anyway. And then during his life review, uh, it didn't really touch upon those parts because apparently they didn't uh, show that so much. And then when it was over, then he thought to himself, I left something out. There is something not really out in the open. And then he, he, uh, he was brave enough uh, to then ask, um, what about being gay? Is that okay? And then the answer was, who do you think makes gay people? And just to show that it's, that's, that it's no, no issue at all. So also these people are important that they are there. Now that concludes uh, the aspect of that everyone is uh, important. And I come now to number nine and that is that we are all one and that is the, the part that i think is very very important um i'll quote you this line th these lines from a dutch and the ear and she said everything i do has influence on everything nothing is lost it is a kind of law of conservation of energy Remember from physics, there's a law of conservation of energy. That is why we shouldn't do to others what we don't want for ourselves. And moreover, what we send, we will attract. We should also be mindful of our thoughts because we also create with our thoughts. And then there is this story of uh, uh, someone who uh, tried to commit suicide and saw what that had would have done to the world would it have worked out obviously she was uh, she, she didn't die because otherwise we can't say this this uh, we can't rec recount this story but she said it felt like uh, throwing a stone in a pond where the ripples go to places in the pond that you'd never think of because it ripples out in the world. And I saw what that would have done to people that I don't even know. So it goes very far. And then there's this, this uh, woman um, who had her near-death experience during her 
uh, experience, she understands that she is not ready for it, for being there for eternity. So she had to go back, was said to her. And she was happy to go back because she had a daughter that she wanted to care for. Now, she had seen during her NDE so many things and so many truths, and there was such a lot of knowledge that she got. And she thought, I know I can't bring all that knowledge back home again. So what can I do? And she thought of one sentence that would say it all, that would have all of it in that one sentence. And that one sentence is, all is everything and everything is one. All is everything and everything is one. Just to show you that it's what she, what she wanted to, to, as an essence, want to bring back again. Then a, a friend of mine in the Netherlands, she, um, she had a near-death experience and she said, I felt completely perfect, completely one with the light and the love, and I know that it is God. I am in God and God is in me. We are one, we are perfect unity. And there's this other story that I really liked a lot. Uh, that's um, a man who was very interested in history and especially in Michelangelo, the artist in, in, uh, in Italy at that time, ages ago, uh, hundreds of years ago. And um, during his life review, he had a discussion over, he, he yeah, it's sort of a discussion over time, about time. And time is not absolute. And uh, they wanted to show him what it was that you can go through time. And then they knew that he was interested in Michelangelo. So they showed him the Sistine Chapel and the, the painting of the Sistine Chapel. So he was there at one moment witnessing Michelangelo painting part of the, the Sistine Chapel. And it really he blew his mind, but it, it went further because for one fleeting moment, he, he was Michelangelo. He became Michelangelo and he was painting this ceiling. And he said that was staggering beyond, beyond words, that, that experience. And then, um, then, then Rachel Finch is someone who, uh, who couldn't, express her NDE in words. So she, she thought of, um, of poems. She had a book written and it, it was uh, with, with poems in it. And I'll, I'll re read you uh, at least one. Um, oh. Sorry for that. <laughs> I, I don't know how that works. Um, in this space, I know every star. Hello. Oh, sorry. Hello. That's a friend of mine here in the in the flat. She's an elderly lady, and she needs me once in a while. And my telephone is too close to the computer, so that's that's what happened. I'll call her back later. <laughs> in this space, I know each star by name. I house every memory ever made, and I'm high looking below me, besides me, and I see everything. And all I see is everything. So she sees everything. And then this, this uh, poem about her in the, in the tunnel, it's uh, the following. I am in a dark, translucent tunnel, a thin veil of film separating me from the vastness and I'm aware of other beings. I think to myself, who are they? And the quiet voice within me murmurs, they are you. Okay, so uh, then I look, looking at the time, I think I have to speed up a little bit. 
why are we on earth? That's a thing that I wanted to mention. Um, let me just give you one quote there. This, uh, this is a quote from Christina. She was eight years old when she was kidnapped. Um, the guy who kidnapped her drowned her almost. She was rescued by her father just in time. And then she had these conversations with God, she says. Um, and she says that he, she received uh, a kind of a recipe for life how to lead life. And the recipe were just a few words. It's love, be loved, just be, and experience life. Then uh, the 11th thing is when we, the 11th as aspect is the way back. Now the way back is normally it goes very quick. People don't really notice it, uh, but sometimes they do. And um, uh, when they do notice, when they go back into their body, they say that the body feels cold, dirty, and far too small. And Elizabeth Crone said once it, she. Uh, her expanse, her, her being was so big that she had to be squeezed into her body. And Elizabeth, uh, uh, Ellen Dye said something like, I don't know how they got me into my body again, because it seemed like they had to put an elephant into a Coca-Cola can. It's impossible. And uh, Kimberly Clark Sharp, uh, also known in Ions, uh, perhaps, uh, she is very bad at parallel parking. And she said, when I had to go back into my body, it was like parallel parking. It didn't work. It, I was a few feet away from the curb. Uh, so she, she, uh, she was not right into her body. And then she was helped by... Um, uh, the guy that uh, resuscitated her, uh, she was out in, in the street and she uh, had a, a problem. And then this guy uh, gave her mouth to mouth resuscitation. And she said, the moment he put his mouth to mine, that was when I, uh, for a moment, I felt how it was to be him. I knew about his life. I knew his feelings. And it helped me to get uh, the connection with my own body again. And so that, that helped her to get right into her body in, in, a, in a right way. And then the, the last thing is uh, the after effects. There are so many after effects that we, you can see. Uh, depression is one that many people say. And so it's, an NDE is not really easy. Uh, People with an NDE say they they can uh, they are they they feel terrible after their NDE because they actually wanted to be back in that other area. So it's not easy to have an NDE. And Christina, the the, the little girl who was uh, abducted or, or kidnapped and then drowned, she says, "I think of my NDE every every day and sometimes every hour." But most of the time, people don't have fear of death anymore. Um, they, uh, they love nature more. They love to be in the company of other people's uh, people. Uh, they have a lower tolerance for earthly light because that can be too bright or sounds can be too harsh or medicine. They need less medicine. Uh, there's a higher tolerance for the thoughts uh, of other people. Uh, they sometimes can feel emotions of others. Uh, they, uh, they become less religious and much more spiritual. Psychic abilities uh, occur. And there is one, uh, one guy who said, um, children in, in, in uh, the vicinity in, in my block always wanted me to rush underneath the streetlights because if, because he, there is an issue with electricity with NDEers. Some NDEers 
uh, interfere with electricity. And this guy was able to, if he would run under these uh, street lights, they would turn off and on again when he passed. That, that's what happened. So yeah, that, that comes, I, I come to a conclusion now. So those are the, the 12 aspects that I try to uh, bring forward uh, in my book with quotes. I leave it up to people to, to come to their conclusion. But again, if you ask me what, what my conclusion is, then my conclusion is that we are all in fact one. It, that goes very far. Some people say there's a very close interconnection with all and everything. Others say, I am you and you are me. But there are also a lot of and the ears that say we are all God. That God is one big whole and we are all part of it and and so we are sort of one and love binds us and that actually concludes what i wanted to say it's it's been an hour i think i'm i'm not sure this is uh this is what you expected i think i hope i didn't overrun my time because it's it's so so much i have to to say it's and it's so interesting all these stories all these Quotes are amazing, everyone. Thank you for listening.